For those of you that don't know, that is Courtney Slocum on the screen there, and uh, amen, amen. So Heather and I had some uh, time to go spend with her this past week and hear part of the story of what God's uh, doing and has done and is doing in her life. And um, Heather and I have had an opportunity to sit with uh, a lot of different folks recently and listen to stories of restoration. And uh, I can't wait for you to get to hear all these stories. And so... I'm just kind of committed at this point, even though we're about to transition to a new series in two weeks, we're going to keep hearing stories. I'm going to keep bringing them to you. Yeah, amen. And they're powerful stories, and um, I can't wait for you to get to hear how good God is and has been and is in the midst of us. Amen? Yeah. You know, uh, God is concerned about lost things. Jesus was concerned about lost things. In Luke 15, uh, he told some parables about some lost things. Uh, A parable of a a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son. And through those parables, you hear the heart of Jesus to see those things that were lost restored. And in some of the stories, the things are small. They're seemingly insignificant because there were others. There were other sheep, but there was one that was lost. There were other coins, but there was one that was lost. There was another sibling, but there was one that was lost. Because Jesus is interested in restoring all things. He didn't look at your life and say, you know, I can do something with this part, but this part, eh. No, he says, in fact, that part is where I'm headed. I'm headed to the place that has been lost, where there's been brokenness, and where someone has stolen from you what was supposed to be yours from God. He heads right toward that spot to see that it's restored. The place that you have failed, the place that you've believed a lie, the place that the enemy has taken from you, the place that you really don't want anyone to know, know about, God says, I'm headed there. I've got my GPS site set on it. I've got, I've got you in my Google Maps. I'm headed toward you because I want to restore you. I want to take that spot of your pain and restore it. I want to take it and restore more than what you lost to begin with because this is what Jesus does. Amen? Amen. And he even takes the areas of our life that we think could never be restored. We've all got some of those. And it's not just our life personally, but God takes whole families and does something. He starts in one person and it spreads to one couple And then he spreads that out to another couple in the family and to another couple in the family until he redeems all. That's what he wants to do. And he even goes beyond that and takes what maybe has been a family line of issues. He'll take areas where there's been maybe generations of pain, generations of struggle, generations of sin even, Jesus comes in and he interrupts the family line of stuff and says, I'm about to do a new thing. I'm about to restore that which has been broken and lost. Even if it has been handed down through generations, I'm about to interrupt the line and start something new in the generations ahead. Amen? He does. He does. And I love that because those are some of the harder things. You know, you know, maybe you don't recognize it until you get around another family all of a sudden and you see how they do things or how they relate or you hear about stuff in their family and you think, dude, your family, that's crazy. You know, and then you get back home and you look at your own family and you think, dude, (laughs) you crazy, (laughs) you just as weird as them. You just think because it's you, you're not weird. You're weird, you know, right? 
Hello? You know, don't look at somebody else's family and think they're weird because they're looking at you saying you're weird, right? Because we all have those things. We got that stuff that, you know, that's come down to us from two grandpas back, you know. It's just, it's come down through the line and I don't know what it is for your family. Maybe it's, you know, some anger. Maybe it's some bitterness. Maybe it's some addiction stuff. I don't know what it is. But it happens in every family. I, I love my parents. They went home to be with the Lord years ago. And they, um, they passed on to me some rich, rich blessings. But because they were people like us, they also passed along some things that were just part of being people, right? And they came to me. They came in my DNA. They came because of being born into the Treadaway family. And then I learned it because it was what I saw every day. You know, I see it in my family. It's what happens for our children. They watch stuff happen in our family and they do what they see. And we all think what we saw is what everybody else does. Until you get around some other family and think, wait, our family doesn't do that. And sometimes you think you're glad, you know, our family doesn't do that. But sometimes you think, I wish our family did that. The good news is, Jesus comes in and he can take whatever's been in your family line. I don't care whether it has been addictions. I don't care if it's been anger, if it's been bitterness, if it's been brokenness along the way, if it's a long trail of divorce, if it's a trail of immorality, if a trail, whatever it is, Jesus comes and interrupts it and he breaks that and he starts something brand new. He does. And he gives hope for the future. You do not have to be what you were what your parents were, what their parents were, what their parents were, and I could keep saying this until we get all the way back to Adam, the first man, because he sinned, and when he sinned, everybody born after him is going to be born into a nature, or be born with a nature that has a propensity towards sin. We are born dead in our sins. Because of our long and long ago parent. It's the way it works. And that's my nature. I was born with that nature. I didn't go to school and take a class in Sin 101. Right? I, it was in me already. I found lots of opportunities to act on it. Hello? Right? So it was in my nature. But because I grew up in a home with people in it, it was part of my nurture as well. My nature sought it. My nurture affirmed it. And that's every person, every one of us. Until you come to the day when Jesus comes knocking on your heart, points out your sin, and you cry out for forgiveness, and you receive his grace, and he says, now, I'm giving you the right to be born into my family. And he interrupts the old bloodline with a brand new bloodline. It's the Jesus bloodline. And we walk in this new bloodline that has all kinds of new inheritance with it. It's got a new family group with it. And you learn things from this new father. And you learn things from other brothers and sisters in the faith. Hello? You become part of a bigger family and you learn and you change and God does a new work. I'm grateful for that. Romans 5.12 tells us that as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. It's true for all of us. But I'm also grateful for passages like 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I'm grateful for Acts 3, 19 that says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out and so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is what God does. He begins a process of restoration and he makes all things new. You know, this whole idea of sin traveling through generations, it's a real thing. 
it really, it really happens. People could pull out your parents' pictures and say, oh, I see where you look just like one of them, right? You also have a nature and a nurture that you have received that makes you like your parent, original parent Adam, but also your parents before you. And God even said in the, when he was giving the Ten Commandments, he explained this idea of propensities towards sin and patterns of sin in our life, how they can be moved along generations. In Exodus 20, as part of the Ten Commandments, God said, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is under heaven or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Listen carefully. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. So apart from Christ, this generational pattern just moves from one generation to the next, from grandpa to dad to child to grandchild. It just keeps moving down through the generations, these propensities and these patterns. And they continue until someone turns to God and he interrupts the flow. The rest of that passage there in verse uh, six says, but he shows mercy to thousands, to those who love and keep his commandments. Today, I want to talk to you about how God restores the broken paths because we all have them in our families. We are part of it. And this is not a moment to look back and blame. It's a moment to receive what God has, has given to us so that for the future, there might be a hope in us and for our children and their children and their children and so on. Amen? And this message applies today even if you're not a parent or a grandparent because you have an influence on people around you. And the impact of your life has an impact beyond your life. People are watching and learning and experiencing something about who God is by watching your life. And you can have an impact on generations to follow by your faith. So this morning, God restores the broken paths. We look at Isaiah 58 today. We're going to look at the whole chapter, but I'm just going to give it to you in bookend version. We're going to look at the very beginning, and we're going to look at the very end of that chapter. Because what we have here is God's blueprint for how he breaks generational propensities and patterns and how he introduces a new thing and begin something new for the future. And I'm praying that this gives us hope today because it is no accident that you are alive today, that you are here today, that you've called on Jesus to be your Lord and Savior today. You have purpose. He has a plan for you. It is bigger than just you having a nice job, a nice home, and a nice car, and a happy marriage. It's bigger than all of that. It's way bigger than all of that. Those are more just side benefits, really. And when you understand what your purpose is, God's purpose for your life, those things begin to make a bit more sense in our life. Amen? So Isaiah 58, God is speaking to Isaiah, and he has a message for Isaiah about the people of God as a nation. And what God has to say to Isaiah at first is a little bit um, alarming. He calls Isaiah to something that will not be easy, but it's necessary because the people at this point, by their actions, are not pursuing God. Their heart is far from him. They, they're being religious, but their heart is far from him. Have you ever done that before? 
Have you ever gone through religious motions, but all the while your heart is actually far from God? And you walk into an experience like this, and you sing, and you got your Bible, and you're reading, and you know everything's all cool on Sunday morning, but then you walk out of here, and Monday, it's hell. You're living in it. You're choosing it. And you come back around to Sunday again, and you're all smiles and praising God, and the next moment, you're cursing man, and you're cursing God. That's what was happening in this day for Isaiah. The nation as a whole, religious, but heart far from God. And God has something to say to them. And he begins in chapter 58 with these words. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression. Woo, I told you, it's alarming. This is like you know, wake up call. This is slap in the face. Isaiah, here's the deal. I want you to go to my people and I want you to say it loud and I want you to say it clear. I don't want you to hold anything back. I don't want you to worry about your message being canceled. I don't want you to worry about offending some party or group out there. I want you to spare not. Say it all, say it clear, say it loud, lift up your voice like a trumpet, make sure everybody hears it, make sure everybody knows it, and in case you don't understand what I'm talking about, Isaiah, here's what I want you to do. Tell my people their transgression. Say, well, that doesn't sound so politically correct. That doesn't sound so sensitive to alternative lifestyles. That doesn't sound very caring and graceful. Look, the gospel always, the good news has always involved two parts. God is holy. God is just. His word is true. No man is righteous. We are born in sin. There are none righteous, no, not one, except God himself and his son, Jesus Christ, and his spirit that is holy. Amen? And that is a news that hits us and says, therefore, you need to be redeemed, restored, and made whole, and you cannot do it yourself. No amount of self-effort, no amount of trying to put in place enough self-improvement programs is going to get you there. You're not going to get there by just positive thinking. You're not going to get there by just trying to will yourself into some place of being good. You're not going to be religious enough. It's all impossible. The only way you can do it is by coming to him and receiving what he has for you. It's the only way. But you can't get there if you don't get the bad news first that tells you, sinner, you have transgressed. You have failed. You have fallen. You are not good in and of yourself. If you don't hear that message first, then the rest of it doesn't make any sense. You can't have grace unless someone says first, your situation is absolutely hopeless. You deserve judgment. Until you've had a sentence laid against you, could you ever appreciate when someone opens a prison door and says you're free? You can't know that until you know you have been encaged first. And I'm afraid in this day and time, and I'll put myself in this spot honestly first, I'm afraid the church has not done a good job over the recent generation or two of being consistent about this message. I've walked somewhat of a pendulum over the decades Uh, For a while, by my own choosing, I walked a legalistic life. I attempted to be, try to be as religious as I could in hopes of gaining favor with God. And it made me miserable. Depression, anxiety, frustration, no victory over sin. It was just terrible. Instead of coming to center and receiving what God had for me, I swung in the opposite direction. And I began to teach a message 
that really kind of leaned more toward this idea of um, mercy and grace and forgiveness. Those are all true and they're necessary, but it began to play out in almost like a, let's all just come together kumbaya moment, you know, kind of thing. And um, the only people that Jesus kumbaya with were his disciples, and really it was only about three of them very often. He didn't get with the Pharisees and say, oh, you, you guys, come on, let's all just hug it out, you know? No, uh, Jesus called them snakes, he called them vipers, he called them whitewashed tombs. You know, you, you don't say that in a hug it out moment, you know? Uh, Jesus was straight with people, he called them out of their sin. You have to have that. And the church, I'm afraid today, has walked in some of that, and I know I'm generalizing church as a whole because not every church has been that way. Some churches have stayed true to God's word and, and proclaimed truth and, and, and uh, the, the holiness of God and the righteousness of faith and the cross and the resurrection. But it's important that we have both ends of this message, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whosoever will may come. And you, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you all your sins. And he gives you the gift of righteousness. That changed me. That radically changed me. And so I live today not ignoring the righteous requirements of the law, but I recognize the spirit within me who wants to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. He's done that through Christ, but he calls me to do that, and I want to. I don't do it out of fear. I don't do it out of uh, duty, obligation, or, oh, God's going to get me if I don't, you know, whatever. I, no. When you understand how much you've been forgiven, when you understand how much grace has been given to you, grace will teach you that, uh, that denying ungodliness, we should live righteously and soberly in this present age. Titus. That's, that's what scripture teaches. Are you with me this morning? Yes. And the church has to, has to make sure they're doing both of these things. And so uh, Isaiah is called by God to speak plainly, speak boldly, don't hold back. And boy, in our day, there's a need for this. And I'm afraid, I'm going to generalize again, the church as a whole is struggling to know what to do today. And many are choosing the side of the woke. Many churches are. And they're falling in line with um, policies and practices that are soft on sin, that are like the world wants and is what the world is calling for today. The world has denied God being the one who describes what life is and said, no, man is now God. Man gets to choose what he wants. And if, if man wants to be this version of some kind of gender idea, that's a perversion, by the way. If you, if you want to choose that, the world would say you can and because that's how God made you. Wrong. God is very binary. He made male and female. And they're two. That's it. Anything else is a distortion of what he has made in his very binary form. And it's okay to believe that. It's right to believe that. It takes faith to believe that. And we hold to that. Amen? As the church. God is very binary when it comes to truth. There's not his truth and 500 different versions of it. No, there's his truth and that's it. It's either a truth or it's a lie. That's it. There are no other options. Uh, you're either righteous or you're a sinner. That's it. There are no other options. You're not in some uh, transforming version of that. You're either declared righteous by God or you're declared a sinner by your own sin and by God as well. Right? That's all there is. It's very binary with God. And that's what Isaiah is calling the people out for. And if you read through the rest of the chapter in the middle there, God calls them out for their 
uh, religious showmanship. They're fasting and um, praying and doing all these things to try to look more spiritual. Believe me, there's power in fasting and praying, but not when you're doing it to try to show off. Hello? You, you lose all the blessing in it for that. So as he goes through this, he's, he, Isaiah calls them out because God gives them this message. And they are called to repent of their sin, to turn from their wicked ways, and to follow after God. And then God gives a promise. If you move down toward the end of that chapter, he gives them a promise and says, if you will do this, if you will walk in my ways, if you will turn from your wicked ways and seek me, verse 12 says, here will be the result. Those from among you shall build the old waste places You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. In other words, you may have experienced pain in your life, and not just in your life, but in the generation before you, and the generation before them, and the generation before them. You may have a history in your family of a certain sin, or pattern, or way of thinking, or way of relating, But if you will turn and seek my face, God says, I will interrupt that flow. If you'll repent of your ways, I will cause a break to happen. And instead of you getting the pain and struggle that's come down through your family line, I'm going to begin something new. And from this point forward, you will experience the rebuilding of old waste places. Places that other people in your family or generations have tossed aside and said, we don't need the temple anymore. We don't need this worship of God anymore. We don't need this practice anymore. God says, if you'll turn to me, you'll become those who begin to rebuild what others have cast off and said unimportant. He will begin to rebuild in you places that are new and you will raise up the foundations of many generations He will interrupt the flow and begin something new that will last because that faith is in you, that choice to follow him, that choice to rearrange your life. It will begin to have a benefit reaction for generations to come. Your children will be impacted by it. Their children will be impacted by it because they'll see God's heart in you. They'll see the change in you. And they will grow up seeing that and build their life on that. And you can have hope, God was saying to Isaiah, to tell the people. You can have hope that though there's been a pattern of sin, there can be a pattern of righteousness in your children. And their children will become something very, very different. You know, that's what's happened for us individually. That DNA of sin that was passed down through Adam to generation, to generation, to generation, to generation, which by the way, there's only been one person born who did not have the DNA of sin nature in them. That was Jesus. Because his bloodline came from his father who provided the seed so that he could be born of a virgin. The bloodline did not come from the DNA of Adam. The bloodline came from the DNA of God himself. That's how he could be fully God and fully man and without sin. That's what qualified him to become a savior. And then he lived without sin. That's just a little side note here. So this is what what Jesus does. He takes your pattern that's been existing. He takes the DNA that you've had and he interrupts it and says, now that you've come to me, I'm about to inject a new DNA line into you. A new family lineage is about to be formed in you and through you. Everything that happens from this point forward is going to be infused with my DNA in your life. And so all of a sudden now we become part of the family of God. The father is our father. Amen. The scripture actually says Jesus is our Lord, but he's also our brother. Check it out. 
it really is true. You become part of this family and you should get together at family reunions with this family. It's awesome, you know? You get together in that family reunion, you wait till you see the spread of food that's there. It's cool. And, and all, the, all the love that's there, the forgiveness that's there, the hope that's there, the calling that's there, the purpose that's there, all this comes because Jesus introduces a new DNA into our line. He gives us, a, he gives us an inheritance. He gives us a purpose. All of this comes and he sets us free. And it's such a powerful spiritual DNA that Romans 8, 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is so powerful. He says that it's made me free from the law of sin and death. That that pattern, that propensity that was walking and following me all my days and came into my life and I saw it growing up. When you receive Christ, it breaks that and it's more powerful than the law of sin and death that was coming down to you. Amen? It sets you free. Amen. So Isaiah goes on and he says, and here's the deal. When you walk in this, here's what's going to happen. He says, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of streets to dwell in. You not only will experience it, but you'll have such purpose in your life that God will make you one that other people recognize as someone who is a re the repairer of the breach. You, you will be called that. That's what it says. Those from among you, your children, your families, shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundation of many generations. And the second part of the verse here says this. Or this. You shall be called. You shall be called. You shall be called. The repair of the breach, the restore of the streets to dwell in. It will be so evident in your life that people will begin to come to you and say, hey, um, I noticed there's something different about your life. I noticed there's something different about your family. Uh, I notice there's something different about the way you respond to struggle in your life. I know you've come from a dark past, but God's done something in you. This is what you became known as. This is who we become. If there's ever a day and time in our nation where somebody needs to be known as the group that has the answer, the group that knows how to repair the breach, the group that knows how to restore the streets to dwell in, it is now and it is us who's called to be that. Amen? Amen. This is that time, this is that day, and this is that promise. No matter what you've walked in before, no matter how dark the path has been, no matter what has come down to you, no matter what you thought was going to be your destiny, Jesus interrupts it and says, I have a future for you. I'm going to use you. You're going to be known by my work in your life, not your sin in your life. You're going to be known by how I restore, not what you have done in abhorring me. Whatever you failed in, I'm going to take care of that by my cross and the resurrection. And now I'm going to raise you up and you, you will become the restorer of the paths to dwell in. Amen? Hey, I can get excited about that because that's who we are called to as the people of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's who we are. So... You know, I look, at, um, I look at all these stories that, we've, that you've heard and the ones that are yet to come, and they're all stories of that kind of restoration where God interrupts the normal chain of events with something fresh and something new. So I want you to hear uh, another story today of restoration, and, uh, and this today is with Nick Kinsman. So let's give Nick a hand. Nick, come on up here. And... Um, we're going to talk together just a little bit today. Yeah, grab that yellow mic there. That's awesome. Yes, sir. So, uh, Nick, um, tell everybody who you are, who your family is, and all that kind of good stuff so everybody has a frame of reference. Sure. So, I'm Nick Kinsman. Uh, my wife is Taylor Kinsman, and we have a 10-month-old named Avery, and she is in class right now, otherwise you'd be hearing dad dad over and over and over. <laughs> so, uh, wondering why I'm up here. Yeah. Um, and I work for Southwest Airlines, I'm a software analyst, so I work from home. There you go, that's a good deal. So there's a little bit of groundwork. So uh, you got to grow up in this area. Not many people that can say they grew up in Ovilla, but uh, you did. So tell us about growing up. Yeah, so uh, I, was, I was born in uh, Boston, actually. 
And Hold on. Lived. Let's just take a moment and forgive him. Texan by choice. Okay. Texan yeah. by <laughs> choice. Okay. Let's get that out of the way. Yeah. I told you God restores all things. So. <laughs> yeah. So, and then we moved to Knoxville, Tennessee when I was two, and then here when I was seven. So I've been here ever since, and I'm never leaving. That's for sure. <laughs> But uh, yeah, growing up in this area, I went to Midlothian uh, all, all through school from second grade to graduation. Um, I lived in Waxahachie for a while, and then I lived in Ovilla for a long time. Okay. So for you, um, fifth grade, life's rolling along, mm -hmm. and then something happens. It begins to change a little bit of the, the course of your life. Talk about that for just a moment. Yeah, so uh, in fifth grade, uh, my parents got divorced. Um, it was, it was really tough. Um, and of course, when you're in fifth grade, you don't really understand it fully. Um, you just like, why aren't they together anymore? And they were fighting a lot at the time. Um, and we had been going to church up to that point and continued for a little while after. Um, but yeah, it really did uh, change the trajectory of my life for sure. I mean, I have horrible memories of you know, reintroducing dating for my parents. I have a great stepmother. My dad's been married for a long time, and they're amazing. And, um, but, you know, it's rough at first because it's new, and the wounds are fresh. And so, but whenever my stepdad came around, I remember particularly just to share one memory of how tough this was for me. I played basketball, and my dad and my stepdad got in a fight at my basketball game. So that is, as you can imagine, probably extremely embarrassing. And it wasn't related to a call on the court, necessarily. No, it was totally unrelated. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd probably be in there, too, with somebody. <laughs> All right. All right. And so, um, you, do you live with your mom or dad during this time? What? Yeah, so it was split custody, um, a and it was by choice for them. You know, my mom actually got sole custody you know, to where my dad, you know, would see us on Thursdays and every other weekend and stuff. That's kind of like the standard but they didn't like that and we didn't either. Um, and so we ended up doing like two, three, two, you know, rotating because they lived so close and we could take a different bus, you know, to get to other parents' house. And yeah. so. So just to be clear, this is not an attempt to make his parents look bad, yeah. that at mm -hmm. all. It's not bashing them. But I, I, we can't talk about this story without you hearing a little bit of the backstory to it. Right. Everybody, everybody, has stuff in your life that's happened um, either by your choice or by someone else's choice to you, and it becomes part of your story. So um, what's happening? I, I recognize it's fifth grade, but sixth grade and seventh grade are starting to roll around here. Those are, those are tough years regardless. But for a young, young, young man, what's going on inside at this point in your heart? Yeah, there's... There was really a lack of identity uh, for me because, you know, like, uh, my mom sometimes would talk bad about my dad, and I'd go to my dad's house, and he'd say, you're just like me, son. And so it's like, well, am I bad or good? And, you know, of course, neither of them meant anything by that to affect me, but it did. Um, and so that kind of sent me looking all different places to try to find purpose um, and identity. And at the time, I was actually heavily involved with a youth group. Uh, up into sort of the beginning of high school, so. Okay, but I'm sure there's uh, questions, yeah. some confusion, mm -hmm. there's pain. Mm -hmm. You're trying to navigate life yeah. just alone, mm -hmm. uh, school and all of that, becoming a young man. Um, so as you get into high school, though, you begin to make some decisions. Yeah. Um, what, is that, what is that like? So when I got into high school, I mean, even it was freshman year, um, I started drinking really heavily um, for a long period of time. And then I took a break uh, because I got in bad trouble with my dad. And uh, so I stopped drinking. I learned my lesson, if you will, for a short time. Uh, but mainly into college, I started drinking a lot. Uh, every weekend, you know, parties. Um, and then I started doing drugs. I, I started smoking pot. So... Um, and uh, that was December of 2015 when I started doing that. And so throughout that time, um, I was doing drugs every day. Uh, I pretty much, I probably, like I was, I was trying to think about it so I could 
describe it accurately is I probably smoked like seven times a day. So I was not a sober guy ever, really ever. Um, and of course, drinking all the while. So that was really a dark, dark time. And of course, you're not sober, so you don't, you don't you have any clarity. You're not progressing forward anywhere. And uh, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned this was in early high school. Of course, you're not old enough to buy alcohol. <laughs> you didn't have this lovely beard at the time to look right. like, you, like you could. Uh, so obviously that involves some choices of people that yeah. you're hanging out with. Yeah. I'm not asking you to name names today at any course, but th that's part of what's happening yeah. is you, you find a group that you yeah. get plugged in with, mm -hmm. and, and that group begins to be influencer and provider and yeah exactly yeah yeah there's always a guy to go get get the beer for us kind of deal yes unfortunately happens a lot today too yeah for a lot of people okay so now this is progressing on top of some pain what's mm -hmm. happening in your heart during this during this time um so at first you know when i started partying and doing drugs and stuff I felt accepted because I was in a group of people that liked to do all that stuff. And so for me, that was a new thing. And so I was really loving it and living it up. And uh, every day, I mean, every day. And so, um, but after a while, you know, I started having, I could tell that I wasn't going anywhere. And I just started hating everything. Like, I'd be at a party and I'd be on the couch just watching everybody have fun and I would be just miserable. And so I'm like, the one thing that I was doing that I had fun with and felt like I had purpose in and stuff was really, I hated it now. And so I began to get really depressed. Uh, I would have like anxiety attacks at work. I'd have to just like, I worked at Target at the time. I'd have to just like go, I was a produce guy. I'd just go into the cooler and just have like 10 minutes. I'd just be crying in a cooler. <laughs> so, yeah, not, not exactly what you'd call stable or doing well. So, yeah. yeah. And this is carrying you up into college years mm -hmm. during yeah. that period. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, someone invites you to vertical. Mm -hmm. And this is how, we're three years back, four years yeah, back Yeah, now. 2017. Okay. So uh, talk about that for just a moment. What, what happens after an invite here? Yeah, so um, my best friend is Jackson Christie, and we've been best friends since we were little kids. And, uh, and so, and he was in our friend group. He never did anything like I did, but uh, he was in our friend group, and he was coming to Vertical. And um, of course, I'm familiar with Vertical at the time, because I actually went to Momentum for a little while. Um, uh, in early high school. So I was familiar with Brian, and of course Jackson was too, because he went to Momentum as well. And it was actually, it was a Saturday night, and I just got to his house from a party, and I said, are you going to church tomorrow? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, I'm coming with you. And uh, he said, well, come on. So we rode together up here, and things began to change uh, pretty quick. All right, I'm gonna talk about that for just a moment, what that change looked like in your life. Yeah, so, I continued to do the things I was doing for months after coming to Vertical, but when I was here, it felt safe. Uh, everybody was so welcoming, and I was the person that I wanted to be here. Uh, yeah, it's all right. So like, I, I, didn't, I didn't use language here. I was sober here, um, and I was hearing God's word, and faith comes from hearing God's word. and, and uh, he washed me over a period of months here and uh, baptized right here on this stage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I don't have like a, I got saved on this day. It was like, it was just he washed me over time. Uh, and in July, he healed me of a lot of things, uh, July of 2017. And he, I, I quit smoking on the dot. And never touched it again, ever. I have not since. And I, like it was just cold turkey, and I didn't even think about it. And I, that's not because of me. I can't do that because I loved it. I mean, I would tell anybody I loved to do drugs, and I was very open about it. Uh, I would just tell random people sometimes. 
So not exactly bright, but most criminals are, are not bright. So, uh, yeah. It's true. So, but he, he, uh, he healed me. And of, of that particular addiction, uh, drinking was much, much tougher to quit, which is a shame. It, I think it's harder to quit than a lot of things, and it's the easiest one to do. So that's a shame. Uh, um, that's my personal opinion. Uh, we can talk about that more if you want. But, yeah. Uh, and I also, did, I also smoked cigars. I mean, the big three. Uh, so I was addicted to, to pot, alcohol, and, and nicotine. And uh, the, I dropped the drugs so fast, and then nicotine followed quickly after that. And then alcohol was hard, but God was faithful, and he healed me. And I'm, I'm clean, and I don't even think about it anymore. Amen. Uh, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, you meet someone else in this process that introduces more change into your life. Talk about that for just a moment. Yeah, so I had met Taylor at Momentum, of course, um, and then coming back to Vertical, we reconnected, and um, she had a crush on me, and, uh, and she's a little bit out of my league, probably by, like, a lot. And so uh, we began talking, and we went to go see a movie. We were supposed to go with Jackson, and uh, he bailed on us on purpose, so that it would become a date which I was really nervous for. Um, and that So was I. I'm sure. No. I'm sure. And so uh, we went on that date. We went and saw Spider-Man Homecoming. And when on the way back from that, I said, that is my wife. And so I knew immediately that was, that was going to be the woman that I would marry. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So you get married and uh -huh. then have a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, God changes a lot in your life. Yeah. You have a sense of purpose that you didn't have before. Yeah. Can I elaborate on that? So, yeah, good. You know, my parents got divorced, you know, when I was a kid, like I've mentioned. And all my life, you know, everybody tells people in school, I mean, particularly public school, I don't, it's my only experience, is you need to know what you want to do. What are you going to college for? What are you going to college for? What are you going to do after that? And uh, the whole time I'm thinking, there's nothing that I can think of in particular that I really would love to do. I. And even today, I mean, I love my job. It is the best job I could ever imagine. But growing up, and even still, I would never say, I want to be a software analyst for the rest of my life. <laughs> but I absolutely love it. But God, and I was really wrestling with that for a while while Tay and I were dating. We were actually engaged. And God told me, he said, you're going to be a husband and a father. And that is what your work is. And that's your vocation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, uh, that's, uh, he said, I'll give you a job. And that's how you can pay the bills. And it doesn't matter what it is. But you need to focus on being a husband, being a father, and redeeming that area of your life for your kids. So, yeah. If you don't think that makes a, a father-in-law and a mother-in-law happy, it does. <laughs> Woo. Mercy. <laughs> So uh, Nick and Taylor and Ava are over our house often, and we have a great time. And we'll sometimes go for a walk in the neighborhood if it's not too hot. Uh, and so we're doing that recently, and we're on a walk, and Nick and I are having a conversation, and this realization hits. So talk about that realization. Yeah, so my dad's house is, like, I guess that's a block away? Yeah. A block away from where the Treadaways live. And... Um, and that's where, I mean, that's where I would do all these horrible things. I mean, like, whenever I would get home for the night, I would smoke in my car. And so it's in the driveway. And um, we were going on a walk, and we passed that house all the time. My dad, my dad lives in Michigan now, but we passed that house all the time. And one day I was thinking, you know, if God can redeem me, he redeems everything in my life. He redeems locations. He redeems everything. And I was thinking, like, while we were walking one day, I was just thinking, like, man, I'm standing 60 feet away from where I was killing myself when I'm full of life with my family, my wife, my daughter. I mean, I used to say, I'm never getting married. I never want to have kids. They're annoying, all this stuff. And now that's all I could think of. That's all I want. I want to be with my wife, and I want to have a ton of kids, probably more than she wants to give birth to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> That's a conversation for another day. <laughs> but it was just hey, amazing. Hey, he restores all things. Yeah. So. yeah. 
sorry, I just had to do that. Yeah. Just... that. It was an amazing realization that, you know, he's redeemed, you know, West Lawn Drive in Ovilla, Texas for me. You know, I used to drive down that road after having drinks. I used to sit in the driveway and just, just totally forget about reality, not even be here. And now I'm walking with my wife and I'm holding my little daughter, saying dada and playing games and tickling her and, and the way she looks at me and the way my wife looks at me. And uh, it's pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> it's a good thing. Amen, amen. Yeah. And it's just another evidence, another story that God does restore all things. No matter what the path has been that you've been on, what you did or what was done to you or what was done before you, he can interrupt it by his grace. And when we respond, he can restore far more than what we ever had before or what was lost. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Give Nick a hand. Thank you, Nick. Thank That's you. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So um, our, our, our band's going to come back up. We're going to sing here in just a moment. But I, I want us to uh, take a moment to soak all this in because Nick's story is not the first nor the last. And Scripture is full of those kind of stories. And when God redeems and restores, he wants us to remember that moment and remember the promise with it. Because we could probably talk to Nick about some days that he may have thought, is it going to always be this good or is this just a dream? And in those moments, you remember promises. You remember truths and you hold to those. You hold to those bigger than you do your circumstances or your feelings in any moment. And that's what God has always called his people to do, to remember his promises. So in the book of Numbers, God told Moses to give the people a memory, a promise. He said to them, or he said to Moses, speak to Aaron and his sons and tell them this, that this is the way you are to bless the children of Israel. Aaron was one of the ones who gave leadership to the people. And he said, when you stand before the people, of God, here's what I want you to say to them because this needs to stick in their heads and their hearts. Say this to them, he said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. That same blessing is ours, but even with greater weight today, because we have the blessing of Jesus Christ in our life. I'm not blessed because of me. I'm blessed because I'm in Jesus, and the Father blesses Jesus. And the Father loves him, and when I'm in him, now he loves me the same way. He sees me the same way he sees his son. Every blessing that he has for the son, he has for me. Every protection, every sense of intimacy, belonging, all of that that's in the son is now with me because I am in the son. Amen? I'm seated with him in heavenly places so I can accept that blessing. Amen? And that blessing impacts everybody around me. It impacts my children and their children and their children. Deuteronomy says, know that the Lord, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant mercy for a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. Whew. We serve a good God who interrupts our life with his grace to begin a new family lineage of faith. And we can boldly hold on to that and say, Lord, you have blessed me. I'm blessed in you. And that blessing is going to roll on for my children and their children and their children. Amen? Hey, stand with me as I pray and we sing. Father, this morning we stand 
because of what you have done. We stand because of the gift of your grace and righteousness. We stand in this blessing and we claim it. We accept it. Not because we've earned it or deserved it, but we stand in it with all humility and we claim it for ourselves. We claim it for our children. We claim it for their children. And may they know blessing upon blessing because you've blessed us and we'll live in that. We'll walk in that. We'll proclaim that so that the nations might know that you are God, that we might be the people who restore the path to dwell in, who repair the breach, who are recognized as your people. We stand in that blessing today, Father, and we celebrate in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen.